Hey guys, this is Jonathan Lampell here, and today I've got some cool news for you. You may have heard in the last couple months that Pixar's released their in-house commercial render engine called RenderMan to the public for free non-commercial use, and you can also purchase a license for regular commercial use. Now, before, in versions up till now, we couldn't really use it inside of Blender, but now with version 20 we can, and it's pretty great. So I'll put a link to this website below where you can just go ahead and sign up on their website, download it, follow the instructions there, and also add a link to this GitHub page where you can download the zip file for this add-on, and you can install it in Blender. So once we jump over to Blender and we go into our user preferences, we can just install from file and locate that zip file and it'll appear right here so you can just type in PR man render engine make sure that box is checked and you might want to save the scene because this is an alpha add-on it's not complete and so there may be a few bugs I had it crash on me once or twice so it's still in the early stages but still it's very very cool to try out so we can just switch over to Pixar Render Man Engine, and here I'm just going to set up a couple basic materials and just show how it works in general. So I'm not going to go too in depth because, I mean, I just downloaded this a couple hours ago, so I haven't had a lot of time for testing. If you guys are interested in a more in depth tutorial, then I might think about doing that, just so let me know in the comments below. So let's go ahead and convert this scene to the preview image or something similar that I had before. First I'm going to take this teapot and just add a new material and you'll see right off the bat that it's a new preview image here and it's just a regular diffuse. So once we add render man node tree then we have a whole bunch of options here and a cool thing about render man is you can use it like this in just one normal stack sort of like the blender internal engine where everything is linearly stacked on top of each other but you can also use this in the node editor if you'd like so you can go to node editor go to this material section here and now we have our material node it's one big node but you can also go shift a add any of your bxdfs sort of like the uh, cycle shaders in a way uh, you also have your pattern so this would be somewhat equivalent to your textures or mixing nodes, conversion nodes, things like that, and you also have access to your lights. So I won't really get into any of this right now, but just so you're aware, it does work in the node editor, and that's very, very cool, and it adds a whole lot of power to this render engine. So it's already integrated pretty well into Blender. So first, let's make this teapot just a regular green color. So we can just change this base color to a nice green, and we can see it after a little bit of a delay update right there now it's not going to work with the viewport shading so I'll cover how we render in a bit we're just going to have to set up using our preview here and then render out and test and see how it works and then come back maybe that's something that'll be added later but not quite yet alright for the sphere I want to make it a glass material so it's pretty easy just add a new material add render man node tree and change this from Pixar Disney to Pixar Glass, and there we go. Now, I don't know all of these settings, but a lot of them are pretty common to all render engines like IOR, so I'm going to change that to 1.33 to lower it a bit, so we get a better reflection of that monkey. So that's generally the IOR of water, not glass, but that's okay. It'll It just looked better when I was playing around with it. And you can also add a little bit of roughness, like 0.0. 1 or 0 0.001 whatever you'd like you can change the reflection color a lot of this stuff is fairly self-explanatory so I'll just keep going on with the super basic examples here let's take this monkey and make it blue so I'm gonna add render man node tree make that blue and of course you can change the specular how metallic it is and also we've got controls for roughness and isotropic and a lot of things that you wouldn't get with a normal diffuse shader so this Pixar Disney you can think of as sort of their uber shader of sorts we also have a regular diffuse shader so let's use that on the wall 
add a new material, and I'm going to change this to a diffuse shader. So it's just going to be nice and flat, and I'll change this to a fun green color. It's pretty cool that you can change the front and back color, but since we're only going to be viewing the front, we don't really need to do that. And I think the roughness is fine as it is. But as you can see, this since this is a production render engine, there's a lot more options that we have that would take a lot of time to get into. So when you're comparing this with cycles, a lot of people want to jump right in and say, all right, is it faster? Does it work better right out of the box? And here's the thing with that. It's not necessarily going to be faster, but it's going to handle complex scenes better and give you more control. So if you're just a hobbyist, just kind of messing around, you probably don't need to be using this as it adds an extra step of complexity that you don't necessarily need. But since it's a lot older than Cycles, you have a lot more advanced options that other people might be used to in their workflows, uh, in their professional work environments. And so this really helps out Blender by giving them that option. All right, so lastly, I want to put in some lights, and I'm just going to use these two here. I'll add this first one, and instead of a diffuse or anything, I'm going to use a constant, and that's just going to give a constant color over all of this, no shadows or anything like that, but I can also add a light emission right below that. So I'm going to make this a regular area light, and say give it a intensity of five so it's fairly bright now we have this color temperature right here which is set to zero and that's why if you rendered this right now everything would be very red and it says in the tooltip that's usually between five thousand and eight thousand that's a typical range of color temperature so it a lower value is going to be more reddish and orangish and a higher value is going to be more towards yellow, white, and then sort of a blue. So I'm going to set this to 7,000. Oh, that's an emission map. Not the right thing. Okay, there we go. Color temperature. All right, so there we have a little bit more of an outdoorsy light, maybe an incandescent light bulb. And I'll uh, add another light for this. So constant shader, light emission, area light, and set the color temperature to maybe 5000. So this will be a little bit more of an orange. And set the intensity to 3. So as you can see there's a whole lot more options here which are really cool. We have spotlights, light profiles, you can tweak the shadows and all that stuff. Uh, we won't get into that in this tutorial, but let me know if you want more in-depth render man studies, if that's something that's interested to you, or you just want to stick with cycles. Lastly, I'll just define this world here. And you can use HDRs and stuff like that in the light emission, but I found that I it took a really long time to render for me. Maybe it was just the file that I used was extremely large or something like that. So just for this example, I'm just going to set this to a regular constant shader and set that to a nice blue. Because as you can see, there are no actual world settings. So you'll have to use a environment map or something like that instead. So here in the render settings, we have our normal dimensions, all that stuff. The things that are different are down in the sampling. So honestly, just looking at this, having not seen it previously, I couldn't tell you all, all about this. However, I know that it works a little bit different than cycles because instead of using a particular number of samples, which it does, it goes either between 4 and 128, so if you want less samples, just decrease the maximum, but it also measures the pixel variance to see how noisy it is, and if it's below that threshold, it won't sample anymore. So it is a little bit more efficient in that way. So I'll leave it at all of its defaults, and you can adjust per shader samples here, sort of sort of like branch path tracing in Cycles, a bit different. There's also a really cool option down here under Output to denoise the image. So 
when you click this you can't actually see it rendering while it's going but it produces a very nice smooth image at the end so I'm going to uncheck that just because I want us to be able to see it as it's going and you also have an option for this display driver now if you set this to PNG TIFF or open EXR what it's going to do is going to render in the regular blender image editor and you won't be able to see the result until it's completely finished and it'll just be like your normal render however if you set the display driver to it that's going to be Disney Pixar's in-house image viewer or something like that uh, so if you set it to that it's going to open up in that separate application that was installed while you installed RenderMan so if we just hit F12 and pull that up let's see what happens so it's gonna pull up this image viewer with its own set of commands you can zoom in you've got to hold alt and middle mouse button to move around it's a lot more like normal commands like you would use in V-Ray or something like that but yeah it's looking pretty good you can see it's going over pass by pass and once you're finished I'll just cancel it for the sake of time once you're finished you can go file and export file save it as whatever you'd like either a PNG OpenEXR, JPEG, stuff like that, and you'll be good to go. So this is just an initial test. Let me know if you want more in-depth tests on this because I think it's pretty exciting and very, very cool, especially for the professional part of the Blender community, which I realize isn't necessarily the largest part, but definitely important one nonetheless. So thanks for watching this video. Subscribe for more, and I'll see you next time.